In this video, I do an example of Newton's second law in two dimensions. Alice and Bob are moving a 300 kilogram crate. The ground is frictionless. Alice is pulling on the crate with 500 newtons at an angle 30 degrees above the horizontal. Bob is pushing the crate with 400 newtons angled down 45 degrees below the horizontal, though they are both attempting to move the crate in the same direction. What are the magnitudes of the acceleration of the crate and the contact force of the ground on the crate. First thing, always a picture. We have this crate moving across the ground, Alice is pulling on it with a rope, and Bob is pushing it. I think I have a pretty good visualization of what's going on. It's going to accelerate here to the right. So I'd like to simplify my picture to more of a schematic representation so I can get an idea of these forces and angles. So now I have just this box, and I know there's a tension force, and it's angled 30 degrees above the horizontal. I know there's now this pushing force on it. It's 45 degrees below the horizontal. I like this sort of schematic to go along with my picture. A picture gives me a good visualization, and this gives me a less cluttered idea of these forces and their angles. I want to apply Newton's second law to this problem which means I have to choose an object and find all the forces on that object. Well, let's choose the crate, I think, but we need, still need to find the rest of the forces. So I draw a circle around my crate. What are the forces that cross that boundary? Well, it's the pushing force and the tension force, and the only other force is from the ground. And so there's gravity. It acts as a distance. And now there's this contact force of the ground on the crate. Now we know there's no friction, so there is no component of the contact force horizontally which could slow it down, and so that means the contact force has to be pointing up. Now that we know what the forces are, we need to go to our free body diagram. My free body diagram, my object is represented by a dot, and I've also included axes, horizontal and perpendicular to the ground. I like to have these on my free body diagram because they will help me identify the angles of all my forces in two dimensions. So the first force I'm going to put on there is the tension force. It points off this direction at an angle theta above the horizontal. The second force is the pushing force. So remember for the free body diagram, the tail of the force goes at the center always. Now it is at an angle 45 degrees from the horizontal, I decided to call it phi, so I can keep everything in terms of just theta and phi, and I can plug in my numbers at the end. Another force is gravity, and I know where it's pointing. It's pointing towards the center of the Earth, so it would be down on my free body diagram. And I know that the contact force is up, so it will look like this on the free body diagram. So that's my free body diagram. Before I go on, I still need a coordinate system. I like to put my coordinate system off to the side. I've identified the positive x here to the right and positive y to be up. Now I can go ahead and apply Newton's second law. Newton's second law says the vector sum of all the forces on an object is equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration of that object. There are a lot of ways to go about doing this. I want to show you a method that can really help when you're starting to do these types of problems. Here is a perfectly valid representation of Newton's second law. I have all the vectors, and I've added them all up, and they're equal to the mass of that one object times the acceleration of that one object. The point now, however, is I want to be able to create scalar relationships from this idea that the vector sum is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. And so to help me do that, I've added all the vectors vertically here, and now I'm going to write out all the vectors in component form. To do that, we have to find their components. So the first step is I'm going to look at the tension force and try to find its x and y components. To find the components of a vector, I draw a line from the tip of that vector to one of the axes in such a way that it creates a right angle. Now the magnitude of that vector represents the hypotenuse of that triangle. And then the x component would just be the length of the side along the x-axis when the magnitude is the hypotenuse. And since I know the angle theta, I can use trigonometry to find what it is. 
The same thing for the y component. The y component is the length of that triangle along the y axis when the hypotenuse is the magnitude. And then I can use trigonometry to find it as well. So the x component is just the magnitude times cosine theta. Note I've reserved the component to be all in blue, including the sine. T cosine theta is just the length of the triangle shown, but a component can be positive or negative depending whether it's pointing in the positive x or the negative x-axis. So I go to my figure and I note the component is pointing along the positive x direction, so I add that positive sign there. I can do the same thing with the y-axis. The length of that triangle is just the hypotenuse, the magnitude of the vector t, times sine theta, and from my figure I see that's pointing in the positive y direction, so I've included the sign there. Now let's do the same thing for the pushing force. I draw a line from the tip of the vector to one of the axes such that it makes a right angle. With the hypotenuse of this triangle, the magnitude of the vectors, the components are just the lengths of the two sides. The length of the side along the x-axis is the magnitude p cosine phi, and it is also positive because it's pointing in the positive x-direction. For the y-component, the length of that side is the magnitude p times sine theta, but as you can see from the diagram, it's pointing in the negative y-direction, so I include that sign here. Now let's find the force due to gravity in component form. Well, it has no component along the x-axis at all. The entire magnitude is along the y-axis, so it has no x-component. The entire magnitude, I'm using the gravity model, is the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, and I note from my diagram that it's pointing in the negative y-direction. My approach is to find the components just using trigonometry with all positive numbers, and then always going to the free body diagram and checking your coordinate system to determine the signs. That way you really can't go wrong. So finally there's the contact force. It also has no component in the x-direction, and its entire magnitude lies along the positive y-axis. Now, the sum of all these vectors is equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration of that object, and so I have it in component form as well, with the mass times the x component of the acceleration i hat, plus the mass times the y component of the acceleration j hat. You can see how writing it in this form, it's easy to be able to extract scalar relationships from the vector definition of Newton's second law because how vectors add, all the x components of the vectors must equal the x component of the mass times the acceleration, and all the y components of the vectors must sum to give you the mass times the y component of the acceleration. Those now turn into scalar equations that I can hopefully solve for the quantities that I want, given what I already know. Well, let's take a look at the first one. I know the magnitudes of the tension and the pushing force. If you remember the picture, know the angles as well, and I was given the mass. So with this equation here, I can solve for the x component of the acceleration directly. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Before I do, let's see if this relationship makes sense. It does. These are both the x components of the tension and the pushing force. The larger they are, the larger the acceleration, of course, it's divided by mass because the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. Note that if both of these angles go to zero, then you have the magnitudes, which makes sense. And if those angles go to 90 degrees, then they don't help push at all because they'll be pushing completely vertically. So I can go ahead and plug in those numbers, and my calculator says I have an x component of the acceleration equal to 2.39 meters per second squared. What can we say about the next equation? I mean, I want to find this magnitude of the contact force, but what is the acceleration in the y direction? Is it accelerating at all? <laughs> the answer is, if the t sine theta is greater than mg plus the pushing force sine phi, then the contact force is zero, 
This represents the vertical component of the tension force. It's the component of the force that is trying to lift the block off the ground. And of course, the vertical component of the pushing force is pushing it down, as well as the magnitude of the gravitational force is also trying to push it down. The contact force can only push up. If this component were greater than these, then it would simply lift off the ground. It would no longer be in contact, and the contact force would be zero. So the question is, is that true? And of course it's not. The mg is almost 3,000 newtons, and the tension force had a magnitude of 400, so we know that this can't possibly be true. So that means it's not being lifted off the ground. Since it's not being lifted off the ground, what can we say about the acceleration in the y direction? And we can say that it's zero. The ground is keeping it from accelerating downward. So logically, from the context of the problem, we can conclude that the y acceleration is equal to zero. That means we know everything, and we can simply solve for the contact force. It's equal to the sum of the vertical component of the pushing force plus gravity minus the vertical component of the tension force. I have all those values, so I can plug those in, and my calculator tells me that the contact force is 2,970 newtons. Does this make sense? You know, it is almost exactly just the weight of the box. It's only about 30 newtons off. And that makes sense. It looks like the two vertical components of the other forces almost cancel each other. So it does make sense that this is a reasonable number.